Hey, welcome back everyone, it's Bigfoot. Today's video is on the mental emotions that go through your mind when you hike the Appalachian Trail. So to start off with, I wanna walk you through the mental thoughts that go through your mind from the time you step foot on top of Springer Mountain until you summit Katahdin. So you just step foot on top of Springer Mountain. You're excited, you realized how hard the approach trail was, your physical emotions are high as well as your anxiety. But one thing you realize right away is the physical toughness starts to really set in and set in fast. You get through Georgia and you realize that this trail was much more difficult than you had ever thought. You're sore in your knees, you're sore in your ankles, you get so excited every time that you hit town, you eat as much as you can, you're excited to have a beer, and you are super stoked to actually go to the bathroom on a real toilet. You cross state lines in North Carolina, and you can't but help to look ahead and see the descent and ascent that you have coming up at the NOC. So you get through that, it's tough, it's your first four to 5,000 foot elevation climb, and you can't wait to get to Fontana Dam because you've heard about the Hilton. You get through the Smokies, unscathed, and you get to Hot Springs. Hot Springs is amazing. It's the first big trail town that you've been through and actually the trail passes right through and you decide to take your first zero there or maybe your second. And you get out of Hot Springs and you kind of breeze through the rest of North Carolina, Tennessee as you tiptoe from one border to the other all the way till Damascus. You're excited to be in Virginia. You know that you have a tough stretch of 550 miles ahead of you through the longest state on the Appalachian Trail. You spend time at trail days in Damascus, probably take more zeros than you anticipated or wanted, but it was a blast. You get back on the trail and there are humongous hiker bubbles and shelters are full. You get through the first 100 miles of Virginia and you start to realize that Virginia is a little bit more difficult than you had heard. And then you get to about the halfway point, which is somewhere just past Parisburg. And you tell yourself that whoever said that Virginia was easy is full of crap. And then the green tunnel effect really starts to set in. There's not a lot of views anymore. You feel like all you're doing is climbing two to 3,000 foot mountains and then descending. And again, you tell yourself, whoever said that Virginia was easy is full of crap. So you keep hiking through Virginia and you realize that you only have about 150 miles left of Virginia, but you cannot wait to get out of Virginia. Virginia has been long. It's been so much more difficult than you thought and what everybody else said it would be. You start to really feel the mental effects of the trail starting to set in. You get towards the very end of Virginia. You go through the roller coaster and you say that it probably wasn't as bad as you had anticipated and then you cross into West Virginia and Harpers Ferry. They call this the psychological halfway point. You are so stoked to be in West Virginia and Harpers Ferry. You spend some time at the ATC, you get your picture taken, you chat with all the other hikers and you decide to take a couple of zeros and spend some time in Washington DC and Harpers Ferry. And then you decide you want to do the four state challenge. You get through it, you have some fun, it was a lot tougher than you thought, but you are in Pennsylvania. You finish the four state challenge and realize that you only have eight states left to go. You are a little concerned about Pennsylvania because all you've heard is about the rocks and how difficult that they're going to be to scramble around. So you start hiking through Pennsylvania. You get through about your first 100 miles and really wonder where are all the rocks that everyone keeps on talking about. You pass Duncannon, you stay at the Doyle, you have a blast, and then rea reality starts to set in because you realize that you just hit the rockier part of Pennsylvania. Now, it's not too bad yet because you are almost at the official halfway point. And when you get there, you're excited, you complete the half gallon ice cream challenge you're probably sick because you ate too much ice cream and you probably also realize you should have picked a different flavor because strawberry cheesecake wasn't the best thing to try to eat in 30 minutes. At least it was 
not for me. And then you get back on the trail after you sleep off the ice cream hangover and you are back into the rocks again. The mental side of things starts to set in again because you realize that you spend most of the day with your head down trying to figure out how to scramble around some of the rocks and small stones so that your feet can take a little bit of break and they're not numb for the next seven days. All right, well then you hit wind gap and you hear that you are almost out of Pennsylvania. You're so excited, the rocks are going to be done, they're gone, and life is going to be good again. Well, you cross state lines, you celebrate, maybe you have a victory beer, and then you realize that the rocks didn't go away. And as a matter of fact, you spend the first 30 miles hiking through the very same rocks as you did in Pennsylvania that you are now in New Jersey until you get to the high point of New Jersey. So you pass the high point of New Jersey and the rest of New Jersey is a breeze. All of a sudden, New York comes and you don't know what happened, you don't know how it happened, but the first 20 or 30 miles of New York kicked the living crap out of you. You could not have anticipated this. You looked at Abel's guide. It didn't look like it was going to be very tough. And you start to think, this might have been the toughest 20 to 30 miles that I've had on the entire Appalachian Trail so far. Why didn't anyone ever say anything about New York? Well then you cross over Bear Mountain and things start to get much easier going through the rest of New York. Maybe you take another couple zeros and go into Manhattan to spend some time in the concrete jungle of the world. And maybe it's around time of 4th of July and you want to catch some fireworks. You get back on the trail and you breeze through the rest of New York into Connecticut. You take time in Connecticut, you think, man, this is not too bad. I could do this. And then you get into Massachusetts and you realize that Massachusetts is not too bad. Into the 3,000 foot elevations, you're starting to have views again and life is good. You hike through the rest of Massachusetts and into Vermont and you realize that part of the trail is probably your favorite part. Now, you also realize there are way more hikers than you had ever thought that were going to be on the trail in Vermont. And then you go, oh yeah, that's right. We're on the long trail too. The long trail follows AT for about its first 100 miles in Vermont. And shelters start to become packed again. There are way more hikers than you ever ha can remember since Georgia. You realize that the amount of hikers that are hiking the long trail outnumber that of the AT by almost two to one. Then you pass the junction, the long trail continues on, and the AT splits off. You're excited because you want some of your privacy and solitude again. There was way too many hikers that last 100 miles, and you go through the rest of Vermont. Depending on how wet or dry the year is, things can start to get really muddy now. There's a reason why they call Vermont for mud. You get through Vermont into New Hampshire. This is a monumental moment because you realize that you only have two more states left. You hike your first 60 or 70 miles in New Hampshire and you get to the foot of Musalak. You're excited because this is the gateway to get into the Whites. You're going to be back into the 4,000 foot elevations for the first time in about a thousand miles. You climb up Musalak and say to yourself, this wasn't that bad. What is everyone talking about the whites for? And then you get to the descent. You descend down Musalak, and then you realize, is this what the whites are going to be like? There are parts of Musalak you descend that are treacherous, and you are very careful of your footing, and you take it slow. You get down Musalak, then the next five to seven miles takes you by real surprise. You start your ascent up Wolf Mountain and realize that this is probably the poorest maintained part of the entire trail that you've witnessed so far. And then you ask yourself, is this what the trail is going to be like in the Whites and through the first part of Maine that you keep on hearing so much about? You get through it, you get past Wolf Mountain, you're happy you're done with that because it looked a lot easier on the map, and then you get to Kingsman. 
you start to ascend up Kingsman and you feel like you're actually climbing pitches of a mountain instead of hiking anymore. You get up Kinsman and the views are breathtaking. You're tired, but you're happy. You start to ascend down Kingsman and you come to your first hut in the White Mountains. You're excited about this. You can buy some lemonade, buy a bakery good, use the restroom, and spirits are high. Then you get to the presidential range. You have some tough climbs climbing up. You get to the infamous Mount Washington. Now, there are parts and scrambles that were tough, but you're happy. You're just about to ascend Mount Washington. You can't see anything. You're in a haze of clouds. But what you realize very fast is you are not alone. There are a thousand other people at the very top of this mountain with you, and they had a heck of an easier job getting up there than you did. You get something real quick at the food bar and you want to get the heck out of there because you're not used to being around all of these people. Then you descend down the rest of the presidential range. You realize that the next seven miles are some of the most difficult descents that you've had on the trail. And then you think back, wow, Pennsylvania really wasn't that bad now that I think about it. You're glad to be done with that descent. You go into Gorham, New Hampshire, and you take another zero or maybe even two. You get back on the trail and you're ready to make your ascent up Wildcat Mountain. You get halfway up Wildcat and you say to yourself, I think this is the steepest part of the entire trail. And then you go back after you get done climbing up Wildcat and realize, yep, that was the steepest ascent that we have in the entire Appalachian Trail. You're tired, you descend down to your next hut you grab a snack and refreshment. Well, you call this a short day. Miles become more difficult to come by. And then you're starting to realize that you're almost through the whites. You only have about 10 miles left, but they were difficult as everyone said that they would be. However, they are some of the most breathtaking views that you've seen on the entire Appalachian Trail. So you get through the last part of the Whites, and now you're ready to cross into Maine, the final state. So this happens, it's an emotional moment for you. You take your picture at the sign, you feel all this gratification that you've gone through 13 states on the Appalachian Trail. You have hiked through about 1,900 miles, and life is just sweet. All those tough days, some of those tough miles, really start to make you realize that it's all worth it. Well then, you get into Southern Maine and it kicks the living shit out of you. You get to the notch, the hardest mile, or the funnest mile of the trail. You decide, hey, I'm gonna see how fast I can do this. After about an hour and a half in the notch, you realize that it uh, either was a lot of fun or it was not a lot of fun and now you realize why it's the hardest mile on the Appalachian Trail. And then you go up the arm. The arm is steep, but you've heard so many folks talk about it and it's not as bad as everyone makes it out to be, but it's still tough. You start hitting some of the muddier parts of Maine, but you again realize that Southern Maine is probably just as difficult, if not perhaps more difficult than the Whites. At least some think that. So now you start planning on your last resupplies on the Appalachian Trail. Things are really starting to get real. Uh, some of us start to really crave the end, ready to get off the trail. Uh, some of us are stoked and happy. Some of us are really crabby and no one wants to talk to them. Everyone, mostly everyone, got what they wanted to get out of the Appalachian Trail and they are getting mentally prepared for the end. So you get through southern Maine, you spend a night in Rangeley. It's beautiful, so you decide to take another zero in Rangeley, which I recommend. And then you get to Monson. You do your last resupply at Monson. There is some anxiety about this 100 mile of wilderness, so you decide that you're going to slack pack a part of it. You get through the first third of the 100 mile wilderness and say, yeah, it's a little difficult. And 
then about the next 20 miles, you start to realize it's not as bad as everyone makes out to be. And then you hit the last 40 or 50 miles of the 100 mile wilderness and realize that it's the absolute easiest part of the entire Appalachian Trail. You're able to hike between 20 to 25 miles here these last days and you're feeling really good. You are ready to summit Katahdin. You get out of the 100 mile wilderness, you cross the famous bridge, and now you are looking at the best profile of Katahdin that you've seen. Then you enter Baxter State Park, you get your permit to summit Katahdin, and all of these emotions are just hitting you. Emotions of excitement, some emotions of depression, you don't know what to do with yourself when you get done. You wanted so bad to finish as you were going through these last 200 miles, but now you realize you're not prepared to finish. You climb up Katahdin and realize that this mountain is more special than any mountain that you've seen or climbed on the trail. And then you see the sign. You get up to the sign, you kiss it, you cry, you laugh, you take lots of pictures, and you just bask in the moment. And then you realize reality now is set in. You have to go back to real life. You have to go back to a job, maybe. You might have to go get a job. You have to go back to college. But whatever it might be, reality is going to start setting in right now. Well, these are very common thoughts that you feel as you are going through the entire Appalachian Trail. All right, so that wraps up my video on the mental emotions on the Appalachian Trail. I hope it was impactful for you as it was for me. Thanks again, everyone. Stay tuned for another sighting. And remember to always follow Bigfoot.